cassettes. They're coming back, but if you want to get into it the right way, well your best bet is down at the boot fair, where the best stuff comes along very cheap. This right here is a Sony CFS D20L, one of the better cassette radio hybrids that was released in the mid 90s, which was fairly reminiscent of this type of cassette technology as everyone seemed to own one of these. The nicer high end stuff was available to pretty much everybody at a somewhat decent price, with this unit officially released in 1996 containing three speakers, with the two present on the front and a 2 watt Sony subwoofer on the back, which works somewhat ok and is controlled by the mega bass slider down on the bottom of the unit. Combining together for a whole 6 watts of boombox goodness, it doesn't appear to utilise any form of Dolby noise cancelling and is designed to play only ferric based cassettes, giving me the impression that although it was a mid range cassette boombox, it's not exactly one of the high end ones that was capable of playing all the cassettes out there, and it may have also been primarily used as a radio player. It has recording features though, and a built in microphone to go with that, support for 4 different radio frequencies and can be powered by 6 D size batteries, or of course you can plug it into the mains. This unit here is in somewhat ok condition, and I'm saying that very leniently with what it looks like on the outside. It's your usual boot fair fine covered in dust and currently non working, with paint covering it on a few of the speaker grills, it's also worth mentioning that the cassette tray doesn't actually open, which is an area that we'll fix later on, so why don't we get this thing cleaned up and then get on with fixing it. Now the current issues from what we know is that the cassette tray is sticky, and by sticky I mean it doesn't actually open properly, and then of course you have the issues with the play button, and the fact that when you push the play button there's no actual action on the spindles for the cassette to function, which means that the bands inside have likely snapped, something that is common given the age and condition of most of these units. So why don't we open this thing up and take a look to see what our issue is inside the unit. So now we're inside we can actually see that the bands have perished and snapped off, which in many ways is pretty good, as the last unit I had to fix up they'd completely melted onto all the cogs which is quite unfortunately common given the rubber nature of a lot of the bands, which took a long time to clean up because they become incredibly stuck on and it's just not nice to deal with. When I first opened the boombox I was actually surprised by the complexity and the form factor presented inside as there are a lot of screws to mess around with to actually get the cassette deck segment out so you can have access to the internals, but it's not too hard to do when you eventually figure out what you're doing. It really does limit the access you have to the components that we need to get to, and there isn't a great deal of information about the layouts of this particular model, so one of the main challenges was actually getting some new bands for it, so I just used some for my generic pack from China, which actually ensured that we could get some playback running, and then ensured the motor was also working well, as these tend to fail on some of those older units. Luckily on this machine we seem to be doing absolutely fine. After that we have the main elastic bands which controls the playback at the play function and prove to be harder to get on as you have to remove the spindle to ensure that you can get it on correctly and then place it back on without interrupting the fragile internals. Of course you do need to make sure you have the right size rubber bands in place so that the playback speed is correct as that will also affect the pitch and is very important to get right so I did end up changing the bands around a few times for slightly different ones as it would appear the ones inside were extremely stretched so I ended up using bands that were too large when I should have really used some slightly tighter bands which ended up working much nicer, as you can see by the smooth playback of the cassette section which is now working absolutely fine, albeit not exactly in a form factor I'd be too happy about. But there was one more issue wasn't there? Well the eject button didn't work and I found out why. There was a stupidly small mechanism that had broken away and was probably some of the worst designed stuff I've ever seen inside a cassette player and no matter what I tried it wouldn't fit back in a way that would give it the actual connective strength to push down the tray if that makes sense. So what I ended up doing was I grabbed a soldering iron and used a bits of spare plastic to create this horrible mess of a system which although a complete mess achieves the exact same function which is to push down a small lever which then releases the cassette tray. 
I'm not too sure why Sony had the desire to make this so complicated, but you get the idea. This symbol mechanism has now replaced the eject button, and when you push it lightly it stops the mechanism, and when you push it down fully it will eject the tray. So that's all working nicely. With this unit put completely back together, why don't we go through a few things. In the benchmarks? I guess you can call it the benchmarks, because we are going to be testing the features of this boombox. First of all we have radio usage, which is about as good as you'd expect with minor fuzz coming through from the radio signal, which you can fix to a degree with the fine tuning functionality which is accessible from the top. Still, that's one of the main issues with this type of unit, as a lot of these ended up just being carried out onto construction sites and played at full volume, and a little bit of fuzz isn't going to make a little bit of difference when all you're listening to is just commercial radio. Chances are they're still in use today as we all see these hanging out around, as other than the cassette functionality which tends to go wrong, they're fairly sturdy units. So give this a listen and see what you think of the radio test. That is why you've got to keep listening to heart while you're working or driving, listening on a train, on your laptop in Starbucks, whatever. Just get on your phone and text when you hear Ed Sheeran because today could turn out to be... As for cassette playback, the real reason most of us are here, the actual motor does make a noise which you might be able to hear in the background and the unit does need a ferret cassette to sound its best. As you can tell by some of the fuzz you'll hear, there is a distinct lack of noise reduction present, which a large majority of cassettes come with and is actually quite a useful feature to have which actually aids sound quality and reduces that fuzz in the background. For reference, I'll be testing a few of my cassettes to see exactly what you guys think, and I'll be capturing the audio with my microphone in a closed environment to give an idea of exactly what the device sounds like. So first up, I thought I'd give a go with an early 2000s Type 1 ferric cassette with Oasis's Heathen Chemistry, which personally I found to be one of the best sounding cassettes on this unit, but you can definitely appreciate the sound quality for a cheap retro portable boombox, despite the fact that a sound test on YouTube is never really the way to go about things. <laughs> Next up, seeing as cassettes are coming back, I thought I'd try and use the newest tape I own which is Snow Patrol's latest album, as I grabbed it a while ago while it was incredibly cheap and thought it might come in handy for testing to see how some of those newer, poorly mastered cassettes end up sounding on these older units. Personally, it wasn't very clear at all and playing new cassettes might be something you want to avoid as these new cassettes don't seem mastered well at all. In fact, I'm pretty sure I can make my own that sound better. Admittedly, Dolby is no longer patenting noise reduction, but that's not even the case here because this unit can't even utilize noise reduction. <laughs> Second to this, I tried a homemade cassette of a live recorded concert to see how well it handles things like this, which had been specifically mastered to work on this type of equipment. A standard ferret cassette with no noise reduction implemented to ensure that it ended up sounding like this. It's not too shabby overall and shows an ideal type of playback from a non-commercial type of cassette. It's early, but it's not too late. The future's getting underway. I'm just saying. As you can hear there, the audio was taken directly from the audio jack to give an idea of just how much the speakers play a part in the playback from this little boombox. Personally, we can hear that the speakers are slightly off sounding compared to the direct output from the machine, but generally it makes up for it with its audio level. See, these boomboxes do get loud and they're capable of filling a house with music and it's definitely an achievement given the size and value of this machine and the positioning of the speakers on the device with the one on the back actually achieve decent quality at the higher volumes. 
So there we have it, a one pound boombox. And personally it made for a fun little project as well as something you can actually take outside and use. It's a practical little thing to own and it's got its purpose nowadays at least for me as I can use it to listen to the radio, which I probably won't do, or you can listen to a cassette, which chances are I will use it for. You don't exactly have much control over how the audio sounds as the bass booster option is just for the third speaker, although there are treble controls but it doesn't really change much, but in general something like this beats a lot of the newer and frankly awful cassette players that are being released out on the market today. The best bit is of these things that they're very cheap and they're virtually everywhere provided you don't mind repairing them. You can almost certainly grab a decent player for cheap and even if you want the best experience, well you can grab a high end one from eBay or the boot fair, they spring up all over the place. You can see one in the background from earlier on in the video and that's what I mostly use and it sounds brilliant. So I hope you've enjoyed about this little project that I've embarked upon, and I hope that you've been convinced that cassettes are actually somewhat decent still, and that you might want to have a go repairing one of these machines. Thank you very much for watching, good night. So this video was definitely different, as a few of the newer videos I've been doing, but I hope you've enjoyed it, and there are plenty of normal computer videos on the way as soon as some RAM arrives, and then we'll have a full PC build on the go, and I'll catch you over in that video.